I'd like to welcome you to today's event, uh, and I'd like to offer a very special welcome to those of us joining us from off campus and via webcam. Uh, today's event was made possible by Open Exchange, an initiative designed to foster conversations around the most pressing issues of the day, from race and criminal justice to global climate change and migration. Along with Open Exchange, today's event has been co-sponsored by the ASSU and Stanford in Government. Today, we are very fortunate to be joined by Senator Cory Booker and Nightline anchor Juju Chang. Senator Booker attended Stanford on a football scholarship, studied at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and later attended Yale Law School. In 2006, he was elected the mayor of Newark, and in 2013 was elected the junior senator from the state of New Jersey. His new book is entitled United, Thoughts on Finding Common Ground and Advancing the Common Good. Juju Chang also attended Stanford. Uh, she graduated with degrees in communication and political science, and she is now an Emmy Award winning anchor on the ABC News program, Nightline. We would like to open tonight's event by again saying thank you for coming, and please help me give a very warm welcome to Senator Cory Booker and Juju Chang. glad you're all here. Anytime there's such fabulous weather on a Saturday morning, I think, well, how many people would come in to listen to a senator talk? And clearly, Corey's a favorite son, so we're all here on the edge of our seats and thrilled to be here. Thanks um, for coming today. Thank you for having me. And Corey is here because he's written this fabulous book, um, which I've had the pleasure of reading over the last week, and um, I'm going to ask him about it. But I thought I'd start, since we're here at Stanford, um, I graduated in 87. He's a little bit younger than me, I hate to admit. I, which I didn't know until I looked at your the little bio, and I'm not You're just saying that so because cute. I'm a politician. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm trained. There's a little school in Washington about how to compliment people. Mm -hmm. um, but no, the reality is I did not know you were ahead of me. Yeah, well, it's the co concealer, really. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I recommend shaving your head. You look a lot younger. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, but I want to start about, like, why, why Stanford? You're a suburban kid growing up in New Jersey. Uh, you played football here. Why come here? And, and how did it form sort of who you are now? Well, first of all, I, I, when I, I, I had the privilege of uh, being a commencement speaker for Stanford, and the joke I made is that I got into Stanford because of a 4.0 and 1,600, uh, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600 receiving yards. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I was the most overrated high school football player in the history of America. And, uh, uh, and even still, the older I get, the better I was. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just decided, I said, look, I have a chance to get a football scholarship to any school in the country. And um, amazingly, no schools even made me fill out applications. Uh, the most, any, uh, Notre Dame had me do an interview. Duke had me uh, get teacher recommendations. Stanford made me fill out the full application. <laughs> um, and I came out here, and at that year, 1987, it was ranked as the number one school in America over Harvard and Yale. I know nothing uh, about uh, really Stanford that much, but I came out here, had an incredible recruiting trip in other places, they did other things to uh, appeal to a 17-year-old uh, pubescent boy. Um, uh, but here, <laughs> they focused uh, so much on academics, so much on the full experience, that I said, if I was gonna go any place to play Division I football, uh, why not go to what I, I perceived as the best university on the planet Earth? So I came here. And looking back, The crowd's already with you. Uh, go ahead. Um, looking back, how, what role did Stanford play in sort of forming who you are and defining uh, who you are? I mean, this, was, this, is, uh, this place is incredible. For me, it was. My five years here were just an amazing experience where I stretched myself in ways, challenged myself in ways, and not simply academically, um, but I had professors who uh, uh, just expanded my spirit. and challenged me to be a bit higher version of myself. There was a great story you told earlier when someone asked you if you should apply for a Rhodes Scholarship and your answer was? Well, th this is a, one of the, probably the most impactful professors, and I say professor not in the Stanford sense, but life professors, uh, is a Professor Joni Maxman, who uh, is, uh, was somebody, um, who's right there, who's right there. And, um, you, you, know, I, I, uh, I, you know, I took a class path, path this is something I've, I don't know if I've ever confessed in a Stanford context, but I took an art class, pass-fail, 
uh, back in the days where if you fail a class, it doesn't show up on your transcript. Oh, I remember um, those days. Yes, we, you and I went to <laughs> you and I went to Stanford at a good time. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I barely showed up at this class, and I failed the class, and I'm like, damn it, uh, I got to fulfill this art district. And I was a I was a Neanderthal with the arts, and um, a, a, a I think it was Buck Rogerman who told me another football player said, um, you need to take this class, but he almost, he kind of made me go correct. He goes, but you don't need to take this class for a distribution requirement, you need to take this class because it's the best professor at, at Stanford. And he was just, loved Professor Maxman. And, and you, you meet professors, I, I, if you would ask me that I care about ancient Greek art uh, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old, I would have said, no, I do not care about ancient Greek art. But because the, the passion of a great professor not only makes you passionate about the subject matter, I couldn't wait when I finally went to Greece to get there. Um, uh, but but the, she, I say this story a lot because she was one of those professors that literally changed the way I looked at the world. And I, I remember coming out of her lecture one day and just standing and looking at a tree like I had never looked at a tree before. Um, <laughs> and just noticing things that I, I had, she made me slow down and see the beauty, the majesty, the divinity of the world. And, and so anyway, so my football career uh, came to an abrupt halt. I, I thought I was gonna stay and play for a fifth year um, uh, but, it, uh, but, but basically, it was a sort of a time of insecurity in my life. And she said, you need to, uh, this thing called a Rhodes Scholarship, you should think about applying it, you were made for this scholarship. And my reaction was sort of like, what's a Rhodes Scholarship? <laughs> um, and even when she told me that, that it was two years out of the country, I had never left America, and the thought of living overseas for two years, now I'm like, what was I thinking? But it was, it seemed like a very big stretch. But thanks to her guidance and counseling and others on the campus, I ended up, you know, when, when I really do believe that when, when God closes a door, another one opens. And as my football career came to a close, uh, this amazing opportunity opened and I, and I pursued it. So let's fast forward. You go and get your master's degree at Oxford. Yes. You go to a small university called Yale for law school. Yes, yes. Um, Our that, football team's better. That we might have heard um. of. <laughs> And you graduate with a, something of a sort of crisis of confidence, if not crisis, you know, existential crisis, and what to do. Because with a Yale Law degree and a Rhodes Scholarship under your belt, you could have gone to any white shoe law firm and gone into corporate law, and instead you chose public service. So I want to read a line from your book which really struck me. You said, your 20s are a decade without clear paths, as if you've been walking for a good while on a well-lit road, and now it ends at a dark forest. There are hundreds of directions you could take, none of them obviously right. Like many, I find myself sta standing and staring, hoping for a sign. How did you choose public service after all that? Well, my, my problem wasn't that I didn't know what sector I went into, and I think that a lot of my peers in the 20s had the same problem, is you, you, you're, you're, you're doing, and by the way, this is a crisis of privilege. Uh, as my mom said to me in this, uh, in this section of the book about how you're privileged to even have this, con this, this conflict, but you, these are high class problems. These are high class problems. You're, you're, as my father would say, you're, you're in tall cotton. Um, and um, and uh, my, so the, the challenge for me was I felt this great sense of expectation, this great ambition, this great desire, um, but I didn't know how to dive in. And whether you, whatever your sector is, I knew I wanted to be in public service, mm -hmm. but I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and this, you know, you, we tend to tune out our parents, uh, you're a parent. Um, uh, that you, by the time you're a teenager, you think you've heard everything, you've gotten everything your, your parents could teach you, right? Yeah. And so I was sort of at that moment where I wasn't really listening. Now I listen to my mom every chance I get, but then I was sort of like, you know, she's gonna give me another lecture. She's always asking me what I'm gonna do after law school. I don't wanna hear you're annoying me, um, which, uh, and so I used to try to avoid those conversations. And then this was a really a turning point in my life where my mom at a, at a spring break um, sat me down and asked me that annoying question again, and I kind of snapped at her, which you don't snap at my mother, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I braced myself for her being mad at me, and then she gave me probably one of the best lectures I've received in my life about the difference between fear and faith, and that I was operating from a state of fear about my future when I needed to start operating as faith, and she asked me a very reorienting question, which she said, I, I, and she told me the story of the talents which for those of you uh, who, who know from the Christian faith, it's a story about a master leaving, giving three of his servants um, talents, a, a currency, and two of them go out in the world and risk, take risks and challenges. The other one buries their talent and guards it, thinking he's doing the master's will, and God ultimately comes back, and the two that took all the risks, he rewards them and says, well done, my good and faithful servant, and he rebukes the one 
for, for guarding their talent. And my mom tells me this framing story and tells me that I want you to operate in life not out of fear, but I want you to operate out of faith. I want you to be uh, courageous. I want you to do what you would do if you could not fail. What would you do if you could not fail, Corey? Answer that question and do that. And, and it really was a moment that ignited within me, I think something that gets, gets um, um, dulled within us, which is our creativity, when we are afraid. We're uh, so afraid of failure. Failure. That oh, that guides us. Yeah, and even just fail, afraid of what I would consider mediocrity, you know, mm -hmm. just not living up to the, God, the gifts God gave me. So I, it really triggered a set of events that made me take a very bold decision where I said, if I couldn't fail, I would go to a place that is the most dangerous, uh, underestimated um, uh, people turn their backs. I'm going to move into that neighborhood and I'm going to be a part of a transformation. Um, and so I, I, you know, I always say I follow the, the, the great prophet, which I don't know if we study this prophet anymore at Stanford, but I, I, I followed the prophecy of Chris Rock. Um, and um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I, Chris Rock has a joke where he says, why is it the most uh, why is it the most, um, uh, often most violent street in many cities is named for the man that stood for nonviolence? And, 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 and to, to, to be blunt, I mean, Martin Luther King Boulevard in Newark, even in the mid-90s, had tremendous, uh, glorious places, um, but the South End was, uh, was scary as anything. And that is the cut to the next chapter, which is you say in the book that I got my BA at Stanford, but I got my PhD on the streets of Newark. Uh, most, most, uh, most definitely. I mean, the, there's an old saying that when you come to the end of all the light you know, and you're about to step into the darkness, faith is knowing one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to find solid ground underneath you, or the universe will send you people who will teach you how to fly. You know what's fascinating to me is throughout your book, there's so many people who come and mentor you and become uh, friends to you. And one of them, you, you know, you have one here sitting, Frank Hutchins yes. was another. And he um, played such a pivotal role in your life. He talked about, and you quote him as saying that housing is a human right. Fair housing policies are just as important for people in affluent communities as for people in poverty-stricken communities. Expand on that. Well, first of all, I, I don't think I, and I had studied this at Stanford, but I don't think I really got it until I was sort of working with this elderly tenant leader going around to tenant meetings, and he just sort of took me through the hor horrifically bigoted housing policies of this country and how they literally created these um, ghettos of poverty um, uh, where we still have a nation that's profoundly segregated. New Jersey is the fourth most segregated state in the nation for Latinos, the fifth most segregated uh, state in the nation for blacks. And it's all been the result of perverse housing policies. And in fact, in, in one of the stories I tell early in the book is even how my parents had to enlist the support of um, some courageous housing advocates, go through an elaborate sting operation uh, in order to get um, uh, access into the neighborhood I grew up in. And so most people think that, oh, uh, these, these uh, um, high dense, poor neighborhoods, predominantly people of color, just came about some accident of history. But th there was a conscious creation of these communities. And uh, what we saw in New Jersey, and again, Frank, who detailed a lot of this for me uh, as we drove around, towns would break off from Newark in order not to have their kids go to school with these kids. And, even at that time, in the mid-90s, those towns would hire private investigators to follow around minority children to see, did they really have an address in the town or did they, really, did they live back uh, in communities? It still goes on today. And, and so, when he, as he would sort of detail to me the real um, uh, sort of moral corruption that created these environments where unfortunately, as I learned through him, they weren't just environments of poverty, lack of economic opportunity, uh, violence, uh, decaying conditions, but there were also massive health risks as well, mm. where you would see, um, you know, uh, th th the weird thing for me right now is everybody thinks Flint, Michigan is an anomaly, uh, but it's not. Um, we have children growing up around America in highly toxic environments uh, with l l many cities with uh, towns with lead levels the same as you're seeing in Flint right now, and, and these happen to be poor neighborhoods. Um, uh, most of our Superfund sites are in poor neighborhoods, and now we have longitudinal studies to show that um, th these toxic sites, uh, you have about a 20% more likelihood of birth defects, 20% more likelihood of autism. Um, the asthma rates in inner cities like Newark are three to four times more than the other areas. And all of this is unfortunately the result of our policy choices. Um, and many people talk about the, from the GI Bill 
to um, uh, a lot of the fair housing policies that help generations of Americans enter the middle class, but they don't understand that these policies, when they were created, discriminated against minorities. You're talking about, I mean, you're a legislator, you're talking about some of these bills, the crime bill um, being one that has ushered in a era of mass incarceration, which is part and parcel with housing, one of the most pervasive problems with poverty in America. Talk about, you know, sort of what you've discovered about mass incarceration and what steps we might be able to take. I know it's a lot to unpack. Right, right. right? Well, well what I, I think that as you walk through the book, as you said, these mentors were beginning to sort of give me a lessons in how all of these things are so interrelated right. and that we are responsible um, and, and that we don't think of it that way. Um, but our criminal justice system, most of our cases is the state versus or the people versus. And the first time I walked into a prison, it, it suddenly hit me when I, when I could walk out right. and I just met men who made me think, my first reaction was there but the grace of God, uh, go I. But then as I walked out, I felt this, that I was suddenly, I was complicit because I wasn't confronting the truth. Our prisons, uh, uh, even though we have ancient texts uh, that tell us what we should do to prisoners and what we, how good we should be, uh, the famous uh, uh, Matthew quote, you know, where you visited me in prison, and the, the person says, well, I didn't visit you in prison. You were never in prison. And he goes, even as you do to the least of these, you've done to me. And so as I'm walking out, I, I realize that, wait a minute, I am complicit in this reality that I refuse. It was like trash heaps. I throw trash in the, in the trash basket all the time, never really think about where it goes and what impact it has. But people are not trash. You can sever, uh, the, you can expand the distances, put walls up between us, but we are so spiritually connected to each other that our destinies are, 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 are incontrovertibly, inseparably aligned. And so for me, the, the criminal justice system, most Americans have no idea what we've done to ourselves. No other country has this kind of self-inflicted wound. And I don't care if you're a fiscal conservative, for example, the trillions of dollars that we spend uh, with only 5% of the globe's population, but one in every four incarcerated people on the planet Earth is in our country. Uh, at a time that I was in Stanford and all the way through law school and the time I was elected mayor, during that period, when other countries were beating us in investing in high-speed rail, the quality of their ports, the expansion of their broadband, um, um, the, the investing in their public universities, America's percentage of, of investment into GDP and those things were going down, except for one area, where we did something never before seen on the planet Earth. Uh, we were building a new prison every 10 to 12 days in, the, in this country with a massive infrastructure. Uh, now we have more, in the South especially, we have more people living in our prisons than on our college campuses. And so this is a, a debt we're carrying. But then you, if you look at the Statue of Liberty, which you read the whole poem, we talk about the tempest tossed and the wretched refuse of teeming shores, poor, hungry. It's almost as if that poem at the end of it should say, send us these people because they're the very people we're gonna put into prison in this country. Because if you look at our, you know, uh, Gandhi, excuse me, uh, Mandela and Baldwin talk about this, that if you wanna see the true character of a country, don't go to their halls of power, look at their prisons and see who they imprison. Um, and we in this country, the overwhelming majority of the people we put in prison are poor, the overwhelming majority uh, um, uh, the, a significant amount have mental illnesses, uh, uh, diseases, and are dis wildly disproportionate poor. And so our, our criminal justice system is not targeted towards uh, uh, towns like I grew up in or college campuses like I attended. It's, it's disproportionately targeted on minority communities like the one I live in now where there's no difference between blacks, whites, and Latinos for dealing drugs or using drugs. In fact, young whites have a little bit higher rates of dealing drugs. But if you're Latino, you're twice as likely to be arrested for using drugs. Black, 3.7 times more likely to be arrested. And, and so I witnessed this. Um, I know this does not go on on Stanford's campus anymore, but when I was here, there were a lot of drugs being used. Um, I saw, you know, ecstasy, whippets, um, marijuana, and, and more. Um, but nobody, I never saw a stop and frisk on the way home from right. a frat party here. I never saw a dorm being raided here but you go to, to, to Newark and it's an everyday commonplace thing. Right. And so we, we've now created a reality where we have taken certain communities concentrated in this drug war, where we've now made it so commonplace for convictions to happen. Uh, one out of three black men today will be arrested. And again, overwhelmingly for nonviolent crimes, overwhelmingly for drug crimes that the last two presidents admitted to doing. Um, and what does that do to a community? It devastates that community when you pull men out. And especially when then, then they, their economic viability has been severed 
because once you come out of prison, most states you can't get food stamps, you can't get public housing, you can't get a Pell Grant, you can't get uh, a loan from your bank, you can't get jobs, and then we wonder why we drive violence as a result of that because people left with nothing to do often go back to community crime, 75% are rearrested. And you're so good at pointing that at the crime bill where a lot of these mandatory minimums came in, a lot of nonviolent offenders are put behind bars. Yeah, since the 80s, the 1980s crime bills, 1994, our prison population at the federal level has expanded 800%. The overall prison population in America has expanded 500% just during our, our lifetime. Our lifetimes. And yet, getting back to the idea of common ground, you, you, know, you talk about there's a moral imperative, there's certainly a fiscal imperative to do this as well, um, and that you've been able to reach across the aisle, and you say you have the Koch brothers as an unlikely ally in yeah. this fight against mass incarceration, as well as Ted Cruz, Ted Rand Cruz, Paul. Ted Cruz, Grover Norquist, Newt Gingrich, um, I don't care what your background is, and I say this is an issue that should appeal to everybody. If you're a libertarian, this is the, one of the greatest assaults on liberty uh, in, in the modern era on the planet Earth. If you're a Christian evangelical, I've already quoted Bible verses. If you're a fiscal conservative, it's one of the greatest expansions of, of government bureaucracy and waste uh, that there's been. Um, so, so I found allies and real friendships um, with uh, people across the aisle um, that, that again affirms a lot of the spiritual lessons of the teachers in this book, that we tend to judge each other, that as soon as somebody tells you, if somebody came on TV, as soon as, in fact I saw a study once, and I wish I tried to find it for this book, but it was uh, where they, they put out a policy idea and said it was a democratic policy idea, and immediately 80% of Republicans were against it, and 20%, uh, um, and 20% uh, uh, and 80 of Democrats were for it. As soon as they reassigned it, same policy idea, but they said it's a Republican idea, then those numbers flipped uh, right. because we're not even listening to each other anymore. We're not even seeing each other's humanity. We're judging each other based on very shallow things. And, and so these con connections going to the Senate with a different attitude has it really enabled me to be a part of uh, um, some very good movement on issues like mass incarceration. Talk a little bit about the acrimony on the Republican side of the aisle in the presidential race. I mean, we've seen sort of some of the most sort of petty, personal, uh, really sort of raucous campaigning out there. Who do you admire in the field? What do you think is, is going down in this well, election I, year? You know, and, and I, try to, I try to hope that the book is a lens with which to look at things like this. And, and um, you know, I admit in this, this book is a, a lot about my comeuppances and, and learning lessons the hard way. And I talk about being a jerk when I first got to, my, the first legislature I served on, uh, this is the second I've served on now, was the City Council of Newark, New Jersey. And I went there so feeling like the, the people there are corrupt, when I get there, I'm gonna be a righteous actor for, and I, and I got there and I, and I did it in a way, I like wielded my righteousness as a sword of condemnation, uh, focusing on things that were, are important, but really severing my relationships with my other city council people so that I couldn't get anything done. I was setting records for being outvoted eight to one. There was one- um, Ouch. There was, a, there was one city council person that said, you know, he goes, you gotta learn to count to five, Corey, you gotta learn to count to five. <laughs> and and, and I, I demonstrated in my, my years on the city council, I couldn't count um, because I couldn't. So, so I, 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 I then had another moment where, um, where this, this guy who, if you read the book, most people can't believe these things happened. I was very happy that um, my first campaign for mayor was, and I recommend this to all the students here, if you're gonna have a spectacular failure in your life, have a documentary team there to capture it, um, <laughs> and and I, uh, I I this 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 war I went to with uh, Sharp James, but I I detail a moment where he and I, after me fasting for ten days and praying for ten days uh, on in these projects, um, he comes to the end, to this to this uh, this really protest I was having, and it had so centered me, fasting and praying that I suddenly saw him for the first time, not as an enemy or an adversary, but as another human being. In fact, same age, similar age to my dad, older African-American man. And it, it's funny, because my editor at first had, had struck this from a draft, and I made him put it back in, because it was a moment that I hugged him. It was the first time we had touched. And remember, as you said, we're in this physical, in this cl um, climate now that Governor Chris Christie was being lambasted for human contact, for touching, hugging the president, during, admits, in the midst of a natural disaster in New Jersey, as if that's a bad thing, that kind of human contact. And um, I hugged this man after sort of cleansing myself for 10 days, and I just sort of felt the power of my connection to him. And the part that he had written out was that I breathed deep and I smelled him, 
and it was smell is such a powerful trigger and I, he smelled like my the older men in my family and and it was a very powerful moment for me and then he was so touched by it that here are these future adversaries in a clash that 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 ultimately became that documentary but he puts away his notes turns to the crowd and says something that shocked people so magnanimous he was towards me and the and the protest and he predicts as i said I, I use a clip from the star ledger from the state's newspaper he predicts my future morality and 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 so i i try to live amidst this world right now where we can all i always say we get caught up in the state of sedentary agitation when we're so upset about the world we're seeing and we we're good at condemning it i mean look when i watch a republican debate i i i am very good at sitting down and talking about those Republicans and their debates in that side of the aisle. And, and, I, and it's, some of the stuff is worthy of being deplored. But, but unless you do something about it, you have, a, you, have a, you have a choice to make in your life over and over again every moment, you can accept things as they are or take responsibility for changing them. So, okay, Corey, how do we change Donald Trump and uh, the rhetoric of, um, of, of these people that are there? Well, you can change it. You, you, you change it by being an agent of the, that spirit that you want uh, where you are. And, and you have no understanding that, that evidencing compassion and love and generosity of spirit, and when you face your competitors or your adversaries, how you interact with them resonates for a long time. And there's a moment in this book that I, the beautiful thing about writing the book is I, I discovered by going back and interviewing people from the guys who were dealing drugs in front of my buildings to the tenant leaders, that I found these stunning moments of synchronicity or coincidence. And one of them was, I, 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 I knew the story of my family moving to the town, but only from my parents. I never do what you do every day, which is get the facts as a reporter. And so I put on my, my reporter hat and I tracked down the, some of the lawyers that were involved to see if my parents' story, and my mom has this pension for accuracy and detail, my father, has a pension for hyperbole and exaggeration, so I... You're the perfect blend. I'm the perfect blend of the two. Um, uh, um, and so I wanted to make sure I had the facts right, and so I f tracked down this lawyer named Arthur Lessman, and I, uh, now in his 80s, and I say, hi, sir, I'm Corey, B I know who you are, uh, I'm okay, and I said, uh, sir, I, you know, you were involved in the Fair Housing Council, and, and I just, I started asking him, well, why, <coughs> as a young lawyer, he wasn't making that much money at that point, why did you represent black families to try to move, integrate these white towns? And he said to me something that shocked me. He said, well, I remember it was a Monday. And I'm like, how do you remember <laughs> the day you made the decision and that it was a Monday? And what he tells me is, he goes, I remember it was a Monday because the, so I came to the office and said, Leo, we have to go to Alabama. And why two Jersey boys would want to go to Alabama? Why, why sir? And he goes, because it was the Monday after Bloody Sunday, where I watched on TV a bunch of people face down folks that hated them, that hated them. And I watched these peaceful marchers, uh, as they tried to go down, sit down and pray, I watched them get beaten and bloody. Now, I, he said that at that point, they realized they couldn't afford to close their law offices for one day, not to mention that, and they decided to do what we should all decide to do, I can't change the world, but I'm not gonna let my inability to do everything to undermine my determination to do something. I may not be able to change the hearts of an Alabama state trooper, but I can do the best I can with what I have, where I am. And he said, um, they made the decision to call civil rights organizations in New Jersey, and they bumped into the Fair Housing Council, and before you know it, they get a case file for Carrie and Carolyn Booker. Now, I don't know if those civil rights activists, whose names I don't know, who I can't thank, but I don't know if they knew that instantaneously, that standing on that bridge with love in their hearts, uh, uh, being the victims of, of brutality and abuse, that they would instantaneously change the hearts of two, a Jewish and a, and a Protestant man in New Jersey, that would then do, take another action for a family, my family, that would change my destiny. I wouldn't be right here right now if it wasn't for that chain of events. And so Alice Walker says, the most common way we give up our power is not realizing we have it in the first place. And every day we have the power to trigger causal events like that with, with spirit of energy. And by the way, the opposite of that, manifesting indifference, has a causal effect as well. And so if we have so much power through a small 
action. A Buck Rogerman telling me, you just failed the class, kid. Take this, trust me, take this class. That one little piece of advice created a causal link of events. And so if we have that power, we may think that we can't change a bunch of people standing up and saying we should stop. I mean, I laugh, it sounds so incredible until I went to uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and heard the way our allies are, are how they're receiving, unfortunately, the rhetoric uh, um, uh, for people that say we should stop all immigration for all Muslims. But you may think, I can't do anything about that. But yes, you can. Right now, where you are, you can do something about that larger or about that larger issue. Give the audience because you know a lot of students here are interested in how can I do something? How do I engage? Because empathy is nice, but action is what you're calling but, for. But but so so this is where the young, uh, you know, millennials. Uh, God bless your generation. I know both of you and I wish we could be millennials suddenly. Um, it'd be nice. <laughs> um, I'm a poser for yeah, sure. Poser, I, yes, we were. I was talking backstage about something happened to me at 45 where my eyes just rebelled, <laughs> and, and, and they said, we will read no more menus. <laughs> um, 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 this is the way you will go on a diet, Corey. <laughs> um, um, but when I look at human history, uprisings in Soweto, uh, civil rights, I mean, it has been the creative activism of young people that has done, done amazing things. So who am I to stifle your thoughts about how to make an impact on this world? You know, I remember the It Gets Better campaign. Sure. Um, which I would watch these videos and tear up as I saw uh, 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 an online uh, platform that connects us all was being used to deal with what is still an issue uh, uh, t uh, for suicides. It was something I learned at the bridge when I worked at the Superior Counseling Center, how, how, how horrific the realities of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth is. But here's people using their creativity yeah. to, to, to take people out of loneliness and isolation. We tend, when we're going through problems, to think we're alone in this, to, to send lifelines out through this very creative uh, uh, way of, of being viral with these videos. So I don't know what the next way we do this is, but I do know we have tools that my parents, the civil rights generation, didn't have to organize, to activate, to inspire, to engage. And if we have all these tools, the only thing missing is our, is our creativity uh, in how we can expand the moral imagination of others. So we have about five minutes left of us chatting and then you're gonna be asking questions, so get your questions ready. But let's do a couple rapid fire questions, sure. okay? You're appearing on a lot of short lists lately. Uh, you're, um, That's because I literally am shrinking. <laughs> know, the other thing is, when I was Stanford, I, I might have been in the press guide at 6'4". Six, 6'4", four. Six, four. now, now I'm like 6'3", six, six, you know, uh -huh. I'm, and I'm shrinking. Uh, you're one of Hillary's surrogates in New Hampshire. I and will be in, I'll be in South, South Carolina, Carolina very soon. soon. Um, so you're often mentioned in the same sentence as the word veep. Right, uh, which I, I told, I said this publicly, I am willing to be her vegan practitioner. Um, <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am willing to be that. As the only vegan in, in the United States Senate, um, the... Uh, <laughs> I, I, All right, so I have a, but I have but, a vegan. But I, I will give props to Maisie Hirono, the Hawaiian senator. She is, I've never heard of this, uh, VB6. What does that mean? That means she's a vegan before six o'clock. I see. And she, and she has, not only has she gotten off her statin drugs, because uh -huh. her cholesterol's now gone way down, right. uh, but she has just, uh, you know, she feels like she's living a more compassionate life. Right. She's, she's well, a great model. Well, here's what's amazing to me, you don't drink. No. You don't really have a vice other than carbs, I read. Massive amounts Massive of carbohydrates. Amounts of carbs. Um, uh, I mean, if you gave me a room full of vegan cupcakes in one hour, I would be out to see you in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there was also um, a short list of Supreme Court potential nominees, um, your name, appeared on it. Uh, I, I sent it in. You did, uh, you um, uh, that in. Uh -huh. Whenever I hear some like short list coming up, uh, I mean, when the Pope was being chosen, I just. <laughs> you put your name in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're I just want to be mentioned. Right? I just exactly. want to be mentioned. So, uh, but, but what do you make of the, the, the current sort of debate about, you know, President Obama shouldn't nominate someone, wait for the people of the Republic I mean, the decide. irony of that, that you have and a, a, who's, who's laid to rest today, and, and we should all be, our thoughts and prayers should be with him and his and family, his credible father. Um, uh, he was, whether you agree with his jurisprudence or not, um, he's a man who served our country in, in, in one of the highest offices. Um, but whatever you think about him, jurisprudence, he was an originalist. 
And so if you go right now on your iPhone, pull up Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, it doesn't say the president may, it doesn't say the president can, it says the president shall do this. And, and so- Nominate a Supreme Court nominate. Nominate a Supreme Court nominate. Not wait until the next Not wait until the next election. <clears throat> and so, um, I, I would suspect that any originalist would tell him that he has no choice, he needs to get busy doing this right away. And I believe that there's, you know, I, I think that the senators, and by the way, the Republicans are the majority, they can all vote against any nominee, but to not give that nominee a hearing, to not allow the advice and consent to actually happen, uh, to not allow it to bring it to the floor, that breaks uh, uh, the traditions of this country, uh, the goal, in fact, there's only one time during the Civil War that we had a vacancy in the Supreme Court last a year. And so uh, we have work to do, and I'm looking forward to getting back on Monday and being a part of hopefully constructive dialogue to get this done. Would you rather be a vice president nominee or a Supreme Court justice? I, I, I would rather be uh, in the pantheon of New Jersey officials, uh, Chris Christie, Cory Booker, Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> John Stewart. John, John Stewart. All right, uh, another quick rapid fire and then I'll open up to the audience, uh, which is um, Coach David Shaw came to uh, the reception, wasn't able to join us Let today. me just tell you, uh, and, and I don't want his wife to get insecure. I'm not coming for your husband. Yes. Um, um, <laughs> but, uh, but both of them, they are really one of the first couples of this university. And David Shaw, this is the reason why, so I, I actually played with David, uh, as I joked earlier, when we were both, both had a, a lush head of hair. Um, uh, we were both, both chiseled. Um, and, uh, and he was a smart man. He married at his peak um, and, and seized the moment. She can't really leave him now. Um, uh, that whole three kids thing, yeah, three that'll kids tie thing. you he down. Was, he, like, he played his hand when it was strong. Uh -huh. I have now waited, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, so so I, I'm with your mom. When are you going to settle down and have kids? I, I, I have faith that I will meet my Beshert, uh, my destiny. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I do. Um, okay, good. That's a nice Jewish girl. Yes, well, you, would, um, you would not perceive this black guy and this Asian woman being deep, deeply rooted in the Jewish in community. In the Torah. In the Torah, are, yes. Exactly. Um, um, in fact, we've actually called you all here for a minion. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, you know, things happen when they, when they need to happen. But as I was sitting there watching these two former teammates, David Shaw and you, I, I, it occurred to me the concussion question, you know, right? Right. Given so this is the beautiful thing about, uh, again, I have a, I've played for lots of coaches. I've seen lots of coaches. And this is the reason why I think Shaw is extraordinary. Because there's he has a job with tremendous pressure to put W's up in a, in a, in a, in a world, college football world, where that, many people see that as, addic as about money and about uh, glory, and he has so much pressure on him. But yet, he, and I played with this guy, he was like that then, he cares about his, the fullness of the, of the human being that is on his team. And he, he seeks to be a teacher, not of, of football, which he is an extraordinary one, but he's teaching these young men uh, about how to live uh, great lives of character and service. And so th I feel comfortable with all the controversy here that this is a coach who will always put the well-being of his athlete ahead of that W on the board. And I, I, I wish Stanford understood how rare that is sure. to find a guy like that. And yet you sidestepped the concussion question. I did artfully, I that thought. That was really good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, I, I was giving them a lesson. <laughs> Um, in the, in and the all of that is true, notwithstanding. However, if you were to, I mean, now that we know the yes. full science of This is the most CTE, difficult question I get, and I get it all the time. I'm sure. Would I let my would kid you, play? Would you let your kid play? Would you go back and play if I turned out to play? I, I, I told you, I would not have been a Stanford student. I will sacrifice my skull. Um, <laughs> um, no, look, I, I, I played at a time where the equipment was different and all of that. Would I let my kid play now? I am not married, so I will have to check with my, my future wife. But, um, but I, I would let my child play. Um, uh, because of a lot of the steps that are being taken to, to make the sport safer and safer. Even the way we practice is different than, than you have to understand when I was playing, going full contact all week was, was something that was expected, but we've changed a lot of that. So I think we need to still study the problem. I think we need to make advances. I think we need to start, the referees need to start blowing that whistle and, and calling out uh, bad behavior. But right now I would, yes. Um, I want people to come to, there's one microphone here, one microphone here. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, 
I feel like I want to hear from some many of you, so why don't we do this? Let's take two questions, and then Corey will field both of them. That's a really, that's a great. We'll do it quickly. You've done okay? this before. I have done this once <laughs> okay. or twice. Go ahead. All right. And how do you stop the speechifying? Because when, I, when I was at elbow him. When I was at, no, when I was at Stanford, his karma is going to come back to me. I would come up and give a profound speech, like right, a 20-minute right. speech. Like, where's your question? I would give a TED talk before my question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so no TED talks, but ask a very cool question. I will question. try not to do that. Uh, can you hear me? I hear you fine. I'm a New Jersey State resident, and I'm very happy I voted for you, and my family will continue to vote I for you. I wish I would leap over here and hug you if it didn't make it. <laughs> thank, if there thank wasn't you. an orchestra I would love to pit. accept it. <laughs> where, 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 where town do you live in? I live in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I apologize to everyone who's not from New Jersey for this question. I know they, they, they live less brilliant lives, I think. It's, <laughs> there's a dull cloud hanging over them not being from New Jersey. Thank you. You're the only <laughs> one. <laughs> Um, so we will continue to vote for you, but I just want to ask one uh, quick question. You did amazing things for the city of Newark, um, but the one sort of thing that my, my parents feel, they're both um, uh, people in the teachers union in New yes. Jersey, they feel a little bit let down by your position of charter schools. Now, I understand that in poor neighborhoods there are nuances you can't just uh, um, stand with like true principle in some sense. But uh, I just wanted to hear from your perspective, your, your position on charter schools. Yeah, so that's I'm, great. So that's one question. Okay, yeah, Let's take one more, and then we'll just rapid fire. I am also a New Jersey resident. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. New Jersey, represent. But you notice how he didn't add, and I voted for you. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, you know, the omission is painful, but I don't need to know what you did in the last election. But go ahead. Uh, Where, yeah. What town are you from? Uh, I'm from Newark. Uh, oh, you're from Newark? Oh, uh, no, uh, outside of Newark. Uh, what town? Union. Town. You, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, All right. I, I, and I went to elementary school in Newark. All right, um, which one? Uh, St. Michael's School. All right. Yeah. All right, everybody's getting bored right now. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I know that uh, you uh, support Hillary Clinton, and as you, I'm sure you're aware, a lot of millennials uh, advocate for Bernie Sanders. And I, I, I had not noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was curious uh, as to like what are your key reasons for supporting uh, Hillary Clinton that you would probably suggest to millennials. So both of these questions are actually remarkably excellent, related. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, go um, ahead. So, um, so just on the charter school thing, there I would. I, I, you grew up in Basking Ridge. I grew up in Harrington Park. There's no need for charter schools there whatsoever. We have. You and I went to incredibly privileged school systems. Um, but in Newark, in, in the early, mid 1990s, where we were spending over twenty thousand dollars a year per child and our kids were failing, the majority of our kids were failing to meet the minimum competency tests, um, we needed innovation, and I'm f for public school innovation. And so in the time that I was mayor, the very short period, um, I, I, was, I used to say by any means necessary, we're gonna educate our children, and we're gonna bring in all kind of models of, of new inno education innovation, and I don't care if the charter or, or district is public schools, public option, and what we were able to do in the short time I was mayor is increase, if you were an African American kid, majority of black city, and the black kids tended to be in the poorer schools, poor performing schools, poor neighborhoods, we increased the achievement of our kids. The chance of you being in a high achieving school in Newark during the time I was mayor went up over 200%. The, the, we just got an award of, after study of 50 top cities in America as being the top city in America for a beat the odds schools, high poverty, high performance. We had um, the Brookings Institution, uh, uh, made us one of the top three schools for parental public school choice. That means now a parent isn't stuck in a failing school. They have a, a, a wide variety of, of, of high quality options. And so if you're a poor parent with knowing that your kid's only pathway to college is a great education, we were able to proliferate our city with district schools and charter schools and change the experience in a rapid time. I don't know how many school systems can claim they increase the percentage of opportunities for poor minority kids in that short period of time. So I'm so proud of that work that we did. And it was an urgency for me because, we, for me, we, we don't have slavery in our country anymore, which we do in terms of uh, human trafficking, but in, in the terms of the, the, what we were able to escape. But to, to, have, to take a child and to chain them to ignorance or mediocrity at best is the worst kind of, 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 of damage you can often do um, to a kid. And so I love the work we did. It's not over yet. Um, but uh, uh, it's an urgency I feel every time I go back to Newark, and I'm still trying to contribute towards education uh, empowerment. Now, the one, the, there are some criticisms of charter schools that are absolutely valid, and one of them we try to deal with, which is, well, Corey, 
if you just create 10 good schools, 20 bad schools, those 10 schools are gonna cream off the best students. So what we said is, okay, well time out then, we're gonna create a one in public school enrollment program where, where every parent now lists their top choices for schools. It's really never been done um, uh, in this way in the country as a way to get over that creaming. Um, and and, and it's been, it's, it had the first year rollout, lots of criticism, oh, this is bad. The second year has gotten much better. And as I talk to parents, people really love having choices and options uh, for what's best for their children. And who knows best what kind of school environment is gonna work for their kid, but a, but a parent did. My parents certainly did. And they, that's why they fought uh, against racial discrimination to get me into a great school system. Other parents should have that. Now, this is a, a, another question that really relates to that. I don't have the luxury. I go home every day, uh, excuse me, two or three nights I'm sleeping in DC. But when I go home, I go home to Newark, New Jersey, which is a city that still has high poverty, um, which still has high violence. Um, we, I'm so, I could list a lot of the things we did to move the needle on Newark, um, but every single day I live with a sense of urgency. Um, I am the 21st American in the history of this country to go straight from being a mayor to being a uh, United States Senator. And, and I came with a perspective where, where I was elected in a special election where literally I'm dealing with murders of my children and now I get to Washington. And the first thing I did after I swore my oath in front of the vice president, I'm shaking people's hand. The first policy conversation I had was grabbing Rand Paul by the hand, shaking his hand and saying, let's get to work on the urgencies that are issues. So when I look at the things that from housing policy to criminal justice reform, uh, I, I know both of these people. I know, I know and have worked with Bernie Sanders, who by the way, Vermont has these urgencies. You may think it's an all, all white, uh, uh, has a lot more level, higher level of affluence, but Vermont has like 1% black people, but their prison population is 11% black. So, so don't tell me that that urgency doesn't exist for Bernie Sanders as much as it mis exists for people in South Dakota. And so for me, when I sat down, I've, I've talked with both candidates, uh, I know what their issues are, um, but, but Hillary Clinton's been dealing with issues of race uh, uh, for, and urgencies about it. Even when I was supporting Barack Obama, the Clintons didn't abandon me in my mission and still were willing to talk to me and give me incredible practical advice on everything from the earned income tax credit uh, uh, to other housing policy issues. So as I just made a simple evaluation, when I go home and I can look my residents in the eye about who's gonna advance the needle, who knows these issues backwards and forwards, has policy ideas and plans that actually can work to move the needle. I was a mayor and relied a lot on the federal government. Uh, for, for people who has shown the grit, Hillary Clinton has been beaten down since she was a first lady of Arkansas. Every time she loses, she rises to another level of service. She lost as first lady, they demonized her, uh, attacked her, she rose to another level of service. She lost the presidency, they demonized her, they attacked her, she rose as the Secretary of State. And who does she focus on? I know her inner circle. She liked to go to the Middle East, everybody wants to write about that. Um, uh, she likes to go to the climate conferences, it gets a lot of press. Nobody gave her press for going into, 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 into Africa and dealing with everything from genital mutilation to access to, for women to get access to uh, capital to start businesses and be entrepreneurs. So for me, I love Bernie, I, I literally love Bernie Sanders, but, but um, and, and, and I get a lot, I feel the burn in the, in the sense of the blowback from people when I tell them I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. Um, but, <laughs> but it was never, it was, there's no clearer choice for me the urgencies that I live with in Newark, New Jersey, than to support Hillary Clinton to be the next President of the United States. Thank you. Let's hear two more, and then um, Corey doesn't know how to give a short uh, answer. I so will. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. I, I You're such to, a wonk. Well, well, sorry about that. I will try to go a lot quicker. Go ahead. I am neither a New Jersey resident nor have I had occasion to vote for you. <laughs> so Stanford exists in a bubble, as we say, and and. It, within Silicon Valley as another bubble, so Stanford's kind of the bubbliest bubble. So what's your advice to somebody who is inside the bubble to minimize the effects of living in that bubble? How do we become better global citizens? Oh, I love That's that question. That's a great question. Huge fan. Thank you. As a United States Senator, you voted for the NDAA, which authorized the military to detain people indefinitely without a trial. And the United States is now killing citizens without a trial with magic weapons in the sky. Could you please comment? Sure. So um, um, I'm gonna give that one because I like that question a lot better than this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the, that's the challenge of being a United States Senator is you have to take the bills in their totality. Um, I, I have a lot of problems with uh, things our federal government is doing and, and a lot of concerns about issues of privacy. I just met with Tim Cook when I was here 
about what I think are real concerns I have about um, government overreach. And uh, I've had to take typical votes, probably the first one, I, the most difficult one I did, that turned out not to be right, it didn't turn out the way I expected it to, was uh, uh, a vote I took about arming um, uh, moderates uh, to battle uh, ISIS that didn't, did, did not turn out the way I had hoped it to be. To be. So I analyze things like that uh, uh, as best I can, and, and I've had some tough calls to make, like the Iran uh, uh, deal, for example, is one of them. Um, and I sit, I analyze it, I look at the totality of the bill, and I do the best I think can. But it doesn't stop me from advocating for some of the issues that you're talking about. And I've learned in the Senate that some of the best ways I can make a difference is not the actual vote that I take, but the soft power that I exercise by being relentless with the administration on issues that I think are issues that are important for justice. And I've learned that you can actually move the needle on those things when they find out that they've got a tenacious congressperson that's focusing on the issues. And then, and then um, this is, look, I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges in this country for any of us, because you think this is a bubbly world? Wait till you are moving on, you've got two kids and you're, uh, you're making a nice salary and you've got the urgencies and the pressures of every single day and unfortunately you slot into one of those boxes where it's very hard to see um, the realities of going on. One of the chapters I write is called I See You and, and it was a powerful mentor of mine to just try to get me to, to, to be able to see the realities outside of my bubble to manifest courageous empathy um, that necessitates um, leaving your, your comfort zones. And so I just say, while you are, please never get um, in your life to the point where you're, you're comfortable and, and force yourself um, to be exposed, not just to poverty and injustice, but different cultures within the United States. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, in New Jersey, I've saw discrimination against, um, uh, 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 you know, Jane families, people who are Jane, people who are Baha'i, because of just a, a lack of understanding and compassion uh, uh, that we have. There was a horrible incident in New Jersey against someone who was Sikh, because a person didn't even understand uh, uh, um, the difference between uh, Sikh Americans and Muslim Americans, and their bigotry and hatred of Muslim Americans was misguided in itself. And then you're such an id excuse my language, you're such a bad person um, <laughs> that, you, that, you, that you do so. What my I'm saying, children are here, I'll have you know. All right, and so, it's, and so what I'm saying is that you've gotta, we've gotta be the agents of that kind of, uh, of courageous love uh, and courageous empathy in what we do and, and start to be bridge builders in a world that has too much division. There's so many great questions. I wanna hear more. Thank you for yours. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for, uh, to the both of you for coming out today. I actually have a question for both of you, if that's oh, okay. great. Um, Let's turn the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I think right now we're extremely fortunate as well to have some pretty influential um, administrators in the room. And so one of the biggest topics that's going, or one of the biggest discussions on campus right now is the discussion of the lack of diversity, both within faculty and within administration. Um, I was wondering if you could both could kind of speak to that, both um, considering your, uh, the fact that you were both students here, but also considering your respective fields. Um, I know in the government and also in media, there is also a severe lack of representation, um, both with regards to gender and race. So I was wondering if y'all could speak to All that. All right, you got a lot of snaps going That's on. That's a lot, that's a lot of snaps. Okay, over here. Hi guys. Great um, question, by the way. He's standing in a way like he's a bodyguard. Is he like, <laughs> like, like he's like, I'm watching no. you, Booker, yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, we are actually both counselors at the bridge. Um, yeah. Hi. Oh, he's gonna hi. leap over. Just watch. <laughs> um, so he's not my bodyguard. We both just had a couple. Is he your anger translator? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can't make angry faces, facial expressions, so he makes them for me. Okay. Yes. Um, no, but here we had a couple questions. So one, I remember why I started at the bridge was because it was sort of a healing process and then it became a, commu uh, a community for me. Sorry, I'm a little nervous because you're Cory Booker. <laughs> <laughs> if you really knew me, you would not be nervous. <laughs> um, so I was kind of wondering why you actually started working at the bridge, why, like your relationship with it and sort I of- I got it. The racial dichotomy of um, people that actually are involved in mental health issues or wow, um, that's a uh, uh, other uh, sort of activisty things on campus, or not on campus, but like in the world. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
Do you want to take, you know, she said you? to both of us, okay, diversity. Fine. Well, I'll speak from my narrow experience within media. One of, the, one of my pet peeves is that you go to any small town in this country and you see a, a, a female Asian reporter and they're everywhere. Um, and yet, weirdly, there aren't anywhere near the numbers of male Asian reporters. And um, I see that as a sort of um, barometer for a little bit of the cultural biases that we have, and also some of the self-selection that occurs within uh, Asian communities, because Asian American males tend to be dutiful and go off and be doctors and lawyers, as their fathers asked. And uh, it's the girls who become liberal arts majors. So, but I see that as a sort of, um, metaphor for the larger uh, ails, um, which is to say that some of it is a sort of unconscious bias that occurs within communities, and then some of it too is the, the external biases. And I think that you have to fight both of those uh, in order to make progress. And I think, you know, that's my short answer for, for that. But I think that media imagery is incredibly important. So I think that those little things, like whether you see, you know, Asian performers in, in on television shows or in comedy or whatever, as a, or even in public office, um, that, that those kinds of role models are important. And I think that, that when you look at diversity uh, across the spectrum, you know, you have to look at both unconscious and conscious actors. Carry, carry that burden. And I, and I, and it's tough, you're African American female, um, and they're, American. what's that? Jamaican American. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> My brother married a Jamaican and gained a lot of weight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you are Jamaican American, you're, you're a minority, and, I, and sometimes it gets exhausting, I'm sure, uh, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a majority campus like this, as it did for me. Um, but I just wanna encourage you to carry that burden of being the person that calls the question and is relentless about it. And it shouldn't just be you, it could be anybody on campus. But it, 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 I have found in my life that if I don't call the question, um, then nothing is gonna change. And the example I'll give you is a very simple one. Uh, so I'm the fourth elected African American in the history of, of the United States Senate. And uh, I'm very conscious of the fact this is the first time we have two blacks serving at the same time who were elected in the Senate. And uh, one is a Republican, Tim Scott, and I'm the only African American in the caucus. And I have in brilliant, compassionate activists in my caucus, um, but I just am very aware that I want to always call the question um, if I can. And by the way, not just about African Americans. I try to do it uh, about Latinos, about uh, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgenders. I just want to try to push us to be more diverse. But the reason why I'm going to give the example I'll give you real quick is I get down to Washington and everybody, we have pension funds being managed. This university manages pension funds. The state of California manages pension funds. And who's managing that money? This is tremendous economic opportunity uh, that is assigned maybe based on performance, uh, maybe not, but generally the people that get this opportunity are overwhelmingly white institutions, overwhelmingly male institutions. And a lot of states now, red states and blue states, are realizing that they need to have a pension fund management diversity program. Interestingly enough, they, Barclays did a study that showed that the women managers and minority managers are outperforming the general pension fund managers, so it's actually turning out to be a pretty good thing. Federal government, I get down there, and this is, this is, we have a federal government that's a lot diverse, but I find out, I call the question, do we have, a, in this, the biggest pension funds there are, do we have minorities managing at all? And there was none, zero, no women, no minorities. And so I called the question, I started writing to cabinet secretaries, and next thing you know, there's a White House summit on, on, on this. So I, I just want you to know that this is a lifelong urgency until we get to a country that has the kind of representation and diversity that reflects our population. I, I just really quick, because I'm gonna do this in two minutes, one of the most formative experiences of my life was working at the bridge. And it, it, it taught me um, the truth that we should be far kinder to each other because we're all more fragile than we let on. And it, it helped me discover that sexual assault on this campus was far more rife than I ever knew as a, as a male uh, um, at the time, that depression, mental health is far more prevalent than we all will let on, that uh, uh, suicides coming out, I, I, it just taught me a depth of compassion and love uh, and how much we need to be there for each other. So I can go on about what the bridge did to me, but I still to this day lean on my experiences at the bridge. It's the first time I ran a nonprofit, had to think about marketing, how do we expand our reach, keeping metrics, it, amazing. But the final part of what you talk about, which is um, the access to mental health care, um, it, it's appalling in this country uh, that, I, and I, I'll give you this example, it's kind of heartfelt to me because when I saw the Newtown 
um, uh, shootings. Uh, I, I, I wept, like probably most of us did, and then I saw the lots and lots of support and counseling that these kids were getting. Well, in my community, uh, uh, we have kids that witness traumatic violence, uh, unfortunately, way too often. And, um, and trauma, we're, we're starting to learn a lot more about childhood trauma and its impact, but there's just not the availability of mental health resources there. And so here we have a country in which um, we don't talk about mental health. It's still so stigmatized. Um, and um, we are now beginning to understand a, a, a lot more about mental health, a lot more about childhood trauma, but, but we're not willing to invest in, in dealing with it. And as a result of that, we pay a much higher price uh, in terms of what happens to, to, to people who are struggling with mental health issues uh, in the long term. And we much rather pay for our prisons, which are being full. In fact, I think you're about 40% chance of being arrested and imprisoned if you have a mental health challenge in this country. And that's outrageous, far more expensive than doing it uh, the right way that we should be doing it. So thank you for your reward. Thank everyone for their questions. I, we could go on and on, but we're out of time. And can I, I just want to make a final, um, hold your applause because I'm going to get in trouble with this. I just want to make a final pitch uh, 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 because there's themes that were coming up that just really moving. I'm glad a lot of this, uh, the students were asking the questions. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things I talk about a lot in the book, and I'll end with this story, is just this idea of love. And, 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 and we don't hear that word used in a way that uh, it's often associated with soft or wimpy or what have you. But I think that patriotism is love of country. And you cannot love your country unless you love your country, women and men. It, it necessitates that. And, and love is, is, I talk a lot in this book about moving beyond tolerance. Like we call for tolerance in this country. It's a cynical, lazy state of mind about the need to move to love, to understand that we need each other. But love is a very difficult thing. And, and, and I heard students, uh, even in their questions, who maybe respected me but disagreed with me or, or, or what have you, I, I've learned that love necessitates having your heart broken a lot. Um, and the question is, is what do you do after that? Um, do, you, does that, do you end up surrendering to cynicism, which I think is like a refuge for cowards? Or do you get up and keep loving, working and sacrificing? And the, and the thing I just want to end with is, in the book there's a moment where I, I hit a nadir in my professional career. I am broken, I am feeling with anger, I'm feeling even darker emotions that are not natural to me, but I'm hurting so much. And, 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 and the woman we talked about before, uh, Miss Virginia Jones, I came in the, up, I got up early the next morning after being, saying things to myself that I've never, I probably never said before about this country uh, and feeling an anger towards America. And I remember walking through the lobby of the projects I was living in and remembering as I walked through the lobby that the tenant president of these buildings who made enough money to move out, that she had a son that was murdered in those buildings. And it sort of struck me as I was walking out feeling like I was 25 feet under the water that she didn't give up for some reason that she didn't leave those buildings and move out. And I got into the lobby, out of the lobby, into the courtyard. It was early in the morning, and only two people were there, me and this woman, this tenant president, small, elderly woman in her 70s, five feet tall. Her back was turned to me, and I'll never forget what happened. Um, I am broken, I am angry, I am in pain. Um, I am losing uh, my confidence that this country can live up to the oath we swear, that we'll be a nation of liberty and justice for all. And at that moment, she turns around and she doesn't say any words. She just throws open her arms. And uh, I walked over to her. I'm so much bigger than her, but I felt like a little boy disappearing in her arms as she wrapped her around. She just said two things to me over and over again that are two words I say to myself still to this day when things get rough, when I start to lose uh, my way or get angry. or not to, Anger is actually a very productive emotion. Um, and the two words that she said over and over again were not religious. Uh, but really about a celebration of those people who did not give up on this country, even though they would never see abolition. They kept working for uh, against slavery, even though they would never see workers' rights, only sweatshops and child labor, but they kept working in the cause. People who would never see a women, woman's uh, equality uh, or even uh, uh, um, the right to vote, but they kept working and sacrificing for it. It's a celebration of just, just that spirit. And, and the two words she said to me, which I leave you with, especially the students, amidst complicated times, frustrating times. Uh, she just was rubbing my back as I was sobbing on her shoulder. Uh, she just said over and over again, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful. So thank you. Thank you. That's great.
You were great. You were awesome. Fantastic.